I will now turn the call over to Jim Woodcock. Thanks, Robin. Thanks uh, for everyone for joining uh, this afternoon or this morning, wherever you may be. Um, tomorrow night, uh, AEW will wear its 20th episode of AEW Dynamite live from State Farm Arena in Atlanta. The show marks AEW's debut in Georgia and signals a full circle mo a moment for the Rhodes family who call Atlanta home. Since you last spoke with Cody in November, AEW has continued to make an impact well into 2020, including a newly announced three-year extension with TNT to broadcast the weekly AEW Dynamite shows. Also, later this month, Cody will take on MJF in the highly anticipated and sold-out AEW Revolution pay-per-view event in Chicago. But first, as you well know, he must face Wardlow in a steel cage bout tomorrow night in Atlanta. So with us today to discuss the current state of AEW is Cody. Executive Vice President of AEW. So without further ado, let's turn the call over to Cody for some opening thoughts, and then we'll open the lines for your questions. Hey, everybody. I, I'm thrilled for an explosive show tomorrow night. This is my hometown, uh, State Farm Arena, formerly Phillips, formerly the Omni. Uh, I have a great deal of history here as a fan and my family as you know, performers and competitors. AEW's had a great start in 2020, including the three-year TNT extension. Uh, we're on a, a great roll. Uh, we've sold more than 100,000 live tickets in 2019, uh, gaining more momentum across TNT's properties. We've, you know, reached 37 million people. And I can't wait uh, for, for Revolution, but this Atlanta event has popped up in a lot of people's hearts, and the synergy around the city is just, it's really... It's contagious, and it's. I haven't felt like this about wrestling here in Georgia and here in Atlanta in a, a long time. So it's just special to feel, and I wanted to be able to touch base with the members of the media and the wrestling media because I enjoy these uh, media briefings that we have a great deal, and I've always tried to give you guys as much information as I can about AEW. So with that said, let's get to let's get to some questions and have some fun. Thanks, Cody. We're going to start off uh, with Nick Hausman of Wrestling Inc. Nick, are you there? I'm here. Hi, can you hear me? You can. I can hear you. Hi, hi, Cody. Thank you so much for taking the time today. Thank you. Uh, well, I wanted to ask you something uh, that's uh, from a couple months back, actually, or not too much, like, I guess, last month now. Um, but Bash at the Beach, did you ever hear anything from WWE legal regarding the name, and can we expect to see more WCW-themed events in AEW's future? Well, as a lot of people know, and as sometimes reported accurately and sometimes not reported accurately, uh, I have a good deal of, of trademarks uh, to my name. Some of them are former uh, WCW events. Uh, I'd actually say, though, it's unlikely you see uh, many more of those. Uh, maybe, maybe one, wink, wink, wink. Uh, but I, I honestly think it's so much fun to have this EVP core and to have Tony Khan, this kind of creative brain trust to come up with our own stuff. Bash to the Beach was just meant to be something fun. It wasn't meant to offend anybody, and uh, it wasn't done in a, in a bitter way. Uh, so it's possible. You can see them. I have those, and I continue to trademark things that I think my dad uh, had a deal in, uh, you know, had a hand in creating. But that's more about protecting his legacy for my mother, uh, who's the, uh, you know, not everyone knows this, but she controls his estate and everything goes to her. There's no money in it for me or for Dustin, anything like that. So maybe maybe you'll see one, and I'm winking heavily, but I don't know about Bash at the Beach or the others. Thanks, Cody. Uh, I'm going to read a question that came in off online here from uh, Darren Paltowitz uh, from Sports Kita. It's a two-pointer, uh, two-part question, Cody. First, in your opinion, who is the most underrated person on the current AEW roster? And number two, as someone who grew up around wrestling greats, did you ever have any encounters with the Macho Man, Randy, Sa Randy Savage? Well, yeah, that's a great question. A great question. Uh, I had a lot of a good interaction with uh, Randy Savage when I was a kiddo, and I was a big fan of Randy, and I always appreciated he, he sounded and acted and was the macho man or the macho king when he was around me. I think he knew as a kid that I, I enjoyed, you know, he called me code man, and I loved that. 
and even my mom for that WrestleMania that happened in Toronto. My mom stood in for Liz because Randy didn't want anyone to know Liz was going to be there the next night when my dad uh, had brought Liz as part of him and Sapphire's act for that uh, mixed tag with Sherry. So they had a good relationship, particularly because my dad was on the uh, he was on the more you know dominant side of that relationship early on, but not unlike Ric Flair, as the Macho Man became a household name, uh, the paradigm shifted. And to see how they worked with each other, uh, you know, from when Savage was a kid in the stands at Florida Championship Wrestling or Championship Wrestling for Florida to when you're at WrestleMania and it's Macho's house. It's unique. Bruce Prichard has a lot of great stories, but if you know Bruce, half of it's made up, but it's all entertaining. Uh, but as far as underrated, not to get super long-winded here, underrated is a dirty word to me because I feel like sometimes it means underpushed or undervalued. But if you're just taking the word at face value, underrated, I think the most underrated guy in AEW is probably Jack Evans. Uh, Jack Evans walks around backstage, super casual, uh, and I don't think people have any idea what he's capable of in the ring, uh, what he's already done in the ring. Uh, he's just special. He's somebody that I always say, I'd really like to get a singles with Jack. Um, I don't know if he knows how, you know, much we value him, but Jack Evans is very underrated. I say that, and then like a hundred other people will pop up in my mind, but that was just the one that came to the surface there. So yeah, I'd say Jack Evans. Thanks, Cody. Next, we're going to flip it to... Unmuted. ...from WrestleZone. Bill, are you on the line? Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes. Hey, Cody, how are you? Good, how are you? I'm good. Uh, so we saw Jeff Cobb show up and debut last week, but ever since then there's been some different reports on if he signed, he didn't sign, and just to kind of get it accurate, can you talk about how long we're going to see him past this week? Uh, still, it's still in gestation. Uh, you know, uh, Muted. Jeff, uh, Jeff works with New Japan, uh, he works with Ring of Honor, uh, and now he works with AEW. I'm a big fan of Jeff Cobb because I like shooters in wrestling. Uh, I don't try to consider myself one with the, my limited amateur background, but I think Jeff is a really, he's a tank, he's a special athlete. So I think that, honestly, just to be transparent with you, it's in gestation. I would hope that he maybe pursue the longer thing with AEW, but I don't want it to impede on anything that he's doing in his soul, if that makes sense. If he wants to travel the globe and, and, and do all kinds of stuff, have at it. That's one of the great things about AEW. There's no blanket contracts. Everybody's contract is different uh, about what they can do, where they can go. And Tony Khan is really, he is tailored and contoured contracts to speak to your sensibility. Hey, this independent means a lot to me. Or hey, going to Wrestle Kingdom means a lot to me. Whatever they may be, if the door's open and we're open for business, but Jeff, I, I'm sorry, I'll just have to keep it vague with him as well because honestly, we don't know just yet. Uh, we do have Jeff uh, for more than uh, just the Atlantis show, uh, but I'd love to see Jeff in more of a long-term deal with us. He's a special talent. Thanks, Cody. Next, uh, I'd like to call on Christian Bruns from Power Wrestling. Christian, you there? Christian? Yes, sorry. I'm here now. That's all. You're good. Perfect. Cody, how are you today? I'm very good, man. How are you? So, um, Dynamite has been on the air for like four months by now, and from a creative standpoint, how has the learning experience been for you guys since then? Is it still a collaboration between Tony and all the four EVPs, and um, how you put things together for TV, or has there been a change or evolution in how approach uh, how you guys approach things uh, on a weekly matter no there's been there's been no change as far as the creative you know you have the four EVPs the guys there in the ring and then you have Tony Khan there that is the creative structure there's plenty of advisors and help how could you not activate resources when you have somebody like Jim Ross standing 10 feet away or Taz or or Tony Schiavone, or, I mean, Dean Malenko, Dustin. But we always like to keep our circle, no pun intended, our inner circle small because this was always Tony's idea to have the EVPs and him 
uh, be on the creative side of things. So there's been no change, and that's been great because we really are forming a team for the long term. I think the only things that perhaps have changed is, you know, every company is going to have growing pains and little lessons. And I know personally, I can't speak for the other guys, I've learned a lot just in the, the 20 dynamites. Uh, I have learned a lot about the workload that this is going to genuinely take uh, versus the workload perhaps we thought. I've learned a lot about uh, being on the other side of management, you know, is unique. You feel like a talent, you feel like a wrestler, but people talk to you differently and the boys and girls are, are, treat you differently. And I want to be uh, a leader in the best way that I possibly can. I want to be honest with everybody. I want to try and communicate with everybody. I try every week to text everyone on the roster, or at least everyone that I have their number. Uh, I try to keep a very open communication uh, with all, because I think that's important. But those are just lessons for me. Mainly, I I learn something new every day. I'm surrounded by really smart people in business who let me uh, sit in the room with them and uh, make decisions. So it's I'm glad it hasn't changed because it speaks to the mission we set out in, in the first place. Thanks, Cody, and thanks, Christian. Next in line uh, coming up is Connor Casey from Comic Book. Connor, are you there? Connor? Oh, uh, yes, yeah, sorry, the audio issue. Thanks for doing this today. Appreciate it. Um, uh, Thank just you. To get your on a uh, on return to Vegas for uh, for double or nothing. I know it's uh, I know Tony's talked about returning to certain spots every year for pay per views. Um, just want to get your thoughts on that. Well, I mean, the MGM Grand's a, a magical place, and as of yesterday, to be able to announce that not only we'll be back for double or nothing, but we'll be back for an encore for Dynamite that Wednesday, uh, it, it's really special. And I hope I don't scoop anybody or spoil this for a team member. I probably am spoiling it. But with that in mind, going from Saturday to Wednesday, that means that we're going to load that those days up with AEW events as well. Uh, we want the entire wrestling world to come out to Vegas uh, for the Memorial Day weekend and our return to MGM Grand and the subsequent Dynamite to be live from the MGM Grand. That building is, for wrestling, it's had some significant wrestling moments in it, but it's had significant moments in sports in it, and those green seats, literally thinking about them, just give me goosebumps, because it's a, it's, it's a magical place. So I think double or nothing will probably find a, a home for quite some time uh, in the MGM Grand. There's a good relationship there. And I, I can see that being the home. Uh, we do want to keep Double or Nothing there in Vegas, uh, all out in the place where it all started in Schaumburg at Sears. Uh, again, I hope I'm not spoiling anybody or pissing anybody off in the office right now, but the other pay-per-views and other special events do have the potential to travel around. Those two just seem at home in those places, though. So I'm very excited about returning to Vegas for you know not just one, but two nights. Thanks, Connor, and thank, thanks to Cody. Next up is Bill Bodkin from Pop Break. Bill? Cody, thanks for taking the call, and I'm very excited that you guys are coming to my area at the Prudential Center in Newark, New Jersey. I look forward to seeing that show. I'm excited about that one, man. Oh, you have, uh, that, there's a reason 10,000 tickets went out the, the door that quick, man. People were chomping at the bit for that one. Um, my question is, um, you guys got extended uh, by TNT for a number of years. Um, one thing a lot of people, I saw a lot of reactions to with that is, how does this impact the way AEW is going to go after free agents? Everyone that has a contract coming up, you know, you immediately see, are they going to AEW? Are they going to AEW? How does um, like longevity and security on TNT change the game for you guys for uh, free agent signings. So that's a really that's a really good question. I always like to think. Uh, I, I look back at All In, and which wasn't even an AEW show, and 
And I remember thinking at All In that the doors the doors might be open for people to, for our peers in wrestling to look at us and go, hey, I want to be part of what they're doing. And when those doors open, how long until we close, close the doors or do we ever close the doors? Now, after, you know, I mentioned across, you know, TNT properties reaching 37 million people, having the youngest wrestling audience, an average of 640,000 in the P1, 18 to 49 each week. Now, I feel like if you say, if you say to us, oh, is this thing you're doing is working, it's kind of, I'm trying to think of a, a PG way to put it, but yes, it, it, the, the revolution is real and it's supported and uh, we, we're loving every second of it. I, I'm glad more people are open to, to coming over best way to put it is the doors the doors remain open but when i look at free agency Mm -hmm. i look at the main word we still look at is fresh are you fresh it doesn't it it doesn't matter how old you are particularly but are you fresh are you are you someone that something they haven't seen do you provide fresh matchups and can you go bell to bell uh because we would be doing ourselves an injustice if we picked up a great deal of free agents that don't have the ability to go bell to bell because we still are a bell to bell wrestling company. Uh, but the doors are open and if more people look at what we're doing and the cascade of events that happened in wrestling because AEW started, um, that makes me happy. That means more of my peers and more of the people who I share these bumps with are getting paid more, um, are, are taking care of their families better, uh, it's a real proud time to be a wrestler and as somebody who grew up in the wrestling business and was always proud of what we did uh i'm proud that that can be happening right now so the doors are open thank you sir thanks both uh now we're gonna turn it over to jim barcelona from the miami herald jim you there yes i was curious on the scouting of talent and how that process goes about. And also, is there a training facility in place for AEW talent coming in, or is that something down the road? So as far as scouting of talent goes, that's become something that we're talking about lessons I've learned on this very call. Uh, I know that me and Taz uh, want to take a trip to the NCAA finals uh, uh, for, you know, collegiate, for folk-style wrestling. Uh, I know that even the combine itself, uh, there's there's eyes on, on the combine itself as far as uh, grooming potentially professional athletes um, who have a look and size and athletic ability. But then again, we also are the, the DIY company and you have guys like Matt and Nick Jackson, the Young Bucks, who, uh, you know, born and bred on an independent level. Uh, they're still mining uh, the independent scene as well. Uh, so our eyes are open to, to all, you know, I mentioned the NCAA tournament, but at the same time, you're, you're looking at, uh, you're looking at the hottest independent acts, all pro wrestling, for example, and, and Northern Cal and all, all around the globe, Defy, all those good places. As far as training schools go, I, uh, am now somewhat, and you guys will probably find more news about this in the next month. Uh, I've now kind of taken to uh, a leadership and ownership role at the school in Norcross, Georgia, which we dubbed the Nightmare Factory. <laughs> it's a big mural put up. It's great. Uh, I've uh, taken a leadership role there, and that's where uh, Sadie Gibbs is going to be training. That's where Anthony Agogo is going to be training. It is not affiliated with AEW other than its affiliation with me. Um, so maybe potentially could grow into a full-time uh, situation, but we don't have that many trainee wrestlers at the moment. Maybe we will uh, one day, but right now everyone, for the most part, is is fairly seasoned or not nursing an injury, but the facility will be open uh, to all as far as AEW is concerned. Just this past weekend, Dean Malenko held a seminar, and 85% of the roster voluntarily showed up uh, so it, it, it's gonna. It seems like if we're willing things to into existence, which is kind of my whole mo. It seems like maybe potentially that spot will become uh, part of AEW in the future. But for now, it's my own thing and a place for people to get reps in and train and uh, uh, people to nurse injuries and, uh, and rehab and come back. Thanks, Cody. I'm gonna um, 
Now I'll go online here. We'll take a couple questions from, uh, from from some of our guests online here. The first one from Kristen Ashley from Bell to Bells. Uh, she'd like to say congratulations to Nyla Rose on winning the women's title. It definitely signals the start of a new path for the women's division. Are there any other future plans for the women's division at this time? And the women's division is just, it's, it's growing. You know, I, I actually would say that, you know, when you, when you hear kind of the, the natural criticisms and you hear the good things about your show, you hear the things people don't like, and you've got to keep your ears open. You can't be closed minded to it. Uh, one thing that is going to take time is, is the women's division in particular. It's, it's merit-based show. It's a merit-based wrestling show, and the best wrestlers are going to wrestle on that show. And I think we have some of the best wrestlers and the, some of the best women's wrestlers. I'd really like to see Big Swole uh, emerge. Uh, Britt Baker is on absolute fire. Nyla Rose uh, becoming the second AEW Women's World Champion. Uh, an amazing moment and maybe the best match on the best show we've done all year. Uh, so that speaks to you know, the talent level of Nyla and Rio and that international involvement that will always be there uh, as far as bringing in uh, the Joshi talent. But it's something that I think be patient with AEW because we're actively doing everything we can to, to, to grow the division, uh, to cultivate the division, and to make it a very, very strong uh, women's division. It's, it's a special thing right now in wrestling how popular women's wrestling has become and how genuinely it does. I, I think some people think certain people are out to get woke points with women's wrestling when in actuality women's wrestling does incredibly well in the minute by minute. It does incredibly well with merch and ticket sales. So we genuinely want to make it a huge part of our brand. So hopefully more of that in 2020 into 2021 and as we go as we go forward. Thanks, Cody. Hope everything's okay there. Um, oh, yeah. We okay. like to just drove by. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right. uh, and, and another uh, submission from online here comes to us from Mike Pankow uh, from Windy City Slam. And Mike's question is, with Revolution coming up in Chicago, can you get into the city's love affair with wrestling? And can you talk a little bit about AEW's relationship with the Chicago area? I mean, it's all it's all right there as far as Chicago was the first place that uh, me, Matt, and Nick, with All In, wanted to, you know, we wanted the best chance to succeed, and we thought Chicago would be the city for it, and we, we technically weren't even in Chicago as we were in Hoffman Estates in Schaumburg uh, with the Sears Center, but Chicago is, is much bigger than that, that one area, which is why with Revolution coming up and Wind Trust. Uh, being the home for that one and sold out for that show. There's something really unique about Chicago. And and, and Chicago, I I think people think it's always been like this in wrestling. And it hasn't always been the hottest bed uh, for wrestling. Uh, Just historically, if you look at it, I'm not sure uh, where it started. I'm not sure if it started with the WrestleMania that they did at Allstate, uh, where especially the crowd level of involvement shifted from it, it became they have their own identity a Chicago crowd just like Philly's wrestling crowd has always had its own identity Chicago all of a sudden has its own identity as a crowd which is so fun as a competitor or a performer but you can never I'm a I'm one of the most loyal people on earth if anything that's you know for for all my you know bad traits my best trait is I'm in incredibly loyal to a fault and uh, I'm, I'm going to be loyal to Chicago throughout the entire future of AEW because that was the place we got things started. It really was. It's a spark for something that people still are arguing isn't real in terms of how popular wrestling is across the globe, uh, which means that Chicago is always going to have our, our flag in the sand, and I hope we can give Chicago the best possible shows. Thanks, Cody. <clears throat> um, next is, uh, we're going to open the line here for Joe Anthony Myrick from Fansided. Joe Anthony? Hey there, Cody. How you doing? Good. How are you, my friend? I'm wonderful, wonderful. So, last summer, Tony Khan said that he was committed to signing more men of color for the singles division. 
And seeing that this is 2020 now, is this still a priority for AEW signing more people of color for the men's single division? Of course. Uh, of course. I'm glad you asked. I'm literally, as not to, not to say that I was multitasking, but at the same time we were, we were all talking, uh, I've been uh, taking a deep dive on the old YouTube into a guy named Chris Bay, uh, who's a prime example of... Uh, you know, somebody that potentially could be good to our singles division. And we haven't spoke to him or anything of that nature. So I'm sure this call will cause some sort of, he'll hear about it in some capacity. But yeah, uh, Tony's commitment is the same as my commitment and Matt and Nick's commitment um, as far as 100%. It's a, it's a demographic uh, that we, we, do, we do well in, but we should be doing much better. And really, I'm dead serious. None of us, are pretending when we say we want the show to be congruent with what America really looks like in 2020 uh, and moving forward. So that would mean uh, more people like uh, Scorpio Sky, uh, for example, uh, more women uh, like like Big Swole, uh, more tag teams like Private Party. Um, so yes, uh, for sure. And uh, we're you know looking at somebody as we speak. So it's funny that you ask when you ask, but yes, that commitment is still our commitment. Next up, uh, I'd like to introduce Sean Ross Sapp from Fightful. Sean Ross? Yeah, thanks for doing this, Cody. Um, you had spoken a little bit about All In earlier, and I think a lot of people know that Ring of Honor have the rights to that show. Is that something that you guys are still actively trying to acquire, or uh, have you all kind of just let that pass for now? I think we we have such a good relationship as far as when I say we, I say uh, me, Matt, and Nick with uh, Joe Koff and Greg um, at Ring of Honor. You know, originally it's, it's, it's a kind of complicated uh, set of documents that tie all in uh, to ROH, but they did so much to help with all in. I mean, they did a significant amount uh, to help with all in from loaning us Gary Jester um, or helping us uh, handle uh, back of house arrangements. Uh, the fact that they let us breach contract to do it, they're a huge part of it. Uh, but I don't think it's something we're actively uh, currently, we, you know, we talk about it every now and then. It's just, it's a really, uh, the, I don't want to sound just super romantic because it'll also sound naive, but I was there, man. I, I, I lived it. I felt that in my heart, that building, that moment. Um, the businessman in me kind of forgets that we probably should get our hands on it just because it's still so fresh and such a great thing that happened for wrestling. And I know that if we came to the table with Greg and Joe, uh, the first, we would be the first person if they ever thought about unloading some things, we would be the first people they would talk to because they're men of their word, um, as are we. And that would, uh, that would be a nice conversation to have. But right now it's just something we've let pass. We've been so focused on AEW and creating, creating new all ins. Um, as we go, and the name All In doesn't belong to ROH. The name All In uh, belongs to Killing the Business, which is, you know, Matt and Nick and uh, Dana Massey. So, who knows? Really, it's a good question. Uh, but uh, who knows what the future holds with that? Thanks, Cody <clears throat> and Sean Ross. And, and now I'd like to turn it over to Richard Fan from Pro Wrestling Torch. Richard, are you there? I am, thank you. Cody, my question, I see a listener from fans or a, a reporter from fans that had asked about representation, but you had mentioned earlier the idea of woke points and how to like avoid that trap. How do you all as a company avoid being so diverse, trying to provide for so many people while also facing some of that criticism fairly or unfairly that you're doing this to be in the spotlight for doing it rather than doing it for its own sake? Well, I think you just have to lead with your content. Um, and your content is what speaks to who you are as a company, you know, who, uh, who's out there front and center on, on dynamite, uh, versus making it a big marketing campaign. I mean, there's plenty of things that you can create a marketing campaign around that still do mean goodwill and that there's nothing nefarious in that. But I, I just think you have to lead, lead with your content. I think most viewers, you know, I mentioned we have the youngest wrestling audience and all the, you know, top 20 new cable series that we were lucky enough to fall into. 
I think most viewers are smart enough to smell when something is being done to check a box and for a publicity sake versus just leading with your content. That's why you don't see that many statements made by the EVPs or Tony every week after a show because who we really are shows on dynamite. And, uh, and that's how I think you avoid uh, making it all some PR shill versus no, this was the best call because these are the best wrestlers and this is the best show. Thanks, Cody. Uh, next up is Ryan Satin from Collider. Ryan? Doesn't sound like Ryan. Hey, can you hear me? Hello? Hello? Yeah, there you are. Uh, I figured it out. Hey, what's up, Cody? A hot mess, Ryan Satin, man. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing all right. I'm not used to doing this on the computer. I'm still old school, usually, usually doing it on my phone. Uh, so uh, I know you've talked a little bit about Nyla Rose here, but what did you think about Val Venus and some of the criticism that he was throwing your guys' way for putting the women's title on Nyla Rose? I think it's just disappointing. You know, if you're somebody that perhaps grew up liking Val Venus, you know, I, I don't know. He's kind of like the disco inferno of, WWE, I don't know if anyone really knows who Val Venus is anymore, but it's disappointing because I don't think he actually means the terrible, awful things he's putting in writing. I think he's just trying to get a booking, and we're not booking Val Venus, and you're not going to be booked anywhere near us. Um, and it kind of goes to the last question as far as that's why, you know, if you, if you guys online, so many of you have an online presence who's, who are on this call. The real way to end some of this this bigotry and transphobia and this negativity is don't hit the ball back. Let them, let don't stop. You know, and I, you know, we all know who we're talking about here. That the same people who do this. When we hit the ball back, you give them oxygen. And I'm not giving Val Venus any oxygen uh, when it comes to Nyla Rose. Nyla Rose uh, won the women's world championship because she was the best woman. She was the best woman at AEW, and that's just that's just it. Um, so yeah, I, I I think we should all, if we take anything from this call, to stop hitting the ball back to those people because it's just, man, think about it. It's 2020, you know. Everybody should love everybody. You know what I'm saying? In some capacity. I know that sounds super hippie of me, but it's just how I feel today. Thanks, Cody. Next up is Zach McGibbon from TSN in Canada. Zach. I get to the building tonight. 
uh, get yelled at for saying that because we don't currently have them on the books, but we have discussed them. So, and our schedule as far as the live event buildings is not ent- entirely mapped out. I would hope Canada. I have a great love for it as far as the type of fan they are. Plus, uh, you know, Chris Jericho being being from Winnipeg, you can't you can't miss there. Thanks, Cody. Well, we are almost to our 45-minute time limit. With that, we have time for one more question. I'd like to take it from Stephanie Franchome from Steel Chair Magazine. Stephanie, there? Yes, I'm there. Uh, hi, Cody. How are you? Good. How are you? Uh, we are trying to deal with a storm in France, so... Pretty strange, what? so the wind is crazy, you know. Um, uh, yeah, but everything is okay. Uh, so now, AEW is pretty much a 30 months pretty plumpy baby. Uh, it's pretty, going pretty good. Um, over the last uh, 13 months, uh, what are the things that you are the most proud of uh, uh, about uh, AEW? And also... Uh, is there one thing um, you have a regret? You regret to do? You regret you did it, or you regret not having done it yet? And I thank you very much. Great, great question. Uh, the thing I think I'm I'm most proud of is no one here at AEW is taking any type of victory laps. We we have our Wednesday show Thursday at four o'clock or a little earlier. Uh, you know, when the ratings come out and when the feedback comes in or even the live feedback there in the building that night, uh, it's instantly right back to what do we do next week as far as, you know, what we have mapped out long form, but also how how do we shake it up? It's just a really kind of uh, friendly and energetic and passionate uh, environment of people who have come to AEW. And um, the more people who speak out who work for us, uh, from the, the, you know, luminary, legendary figures to the younger roster, the more you'll hear that is about how everybody really is excited to get there Tuesday night, Wednesday, do the show, and nobody wants to leave. If that, that passion is, you can't put a price on it. So I'm very proud that that exists within the company. I'm proud we, we don't get ahead of ourselves. We're working very disciplined, and we want to make this right for every wrestling fan and create all new wrestling fans. Uh, as far as regrets, hmm, I don't, I don't think I have, I don't think I have a single, I don't think I have a single regret about this. And I, I'm one of those who does have regrets. You'll never hear me say no regrets, but in this case, uh, I don't have any regret, regrets about the uh, AEW. It's gone, it's gone so well, and people who've come to the events, they can feel that from me and. Uh, the other performers in the ring. So no regrets. I'm very proud of everything, and I'm very proud of where everything is going. Thank you. Thanks, Cody. And really thanks to everyone who joined us here on on the call today. And and, uh, we're unfortunately at the end of our time, but uh, on behalf of everybody, Cody certainly, but also everybody at AEW, want to thank you for for everything you've been doing on behalf of wrestling and certainly AEW over over the past year plus. Uh, for your attention, your time, and your support. So, with that, we're gonna we're gonna close the call. We will be distributing an audio copy shortly, so be taking a, be on the lookout for that. Then we'll uh, see you tomorrow night on um, AW Dynamite, and then look forward to seeing many of you in Chicago uh, in a week's time or so. So, thanks again, and appreciate your time.